Hello, my wonderful, beautiful friends. Guys, welcome back to r slash malicious compliance, where you'll hear super entertaining stories about people who get what they deserve, and a lot of the times, not in a good way. Guys, I hope you enjoy the stories today, and do remember to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. And also, email link's gonna be posted right here for stories and your Reddit post submissions. We're diving in, guys. I worked at Sears while in college. I was in the warehouse, and throughout the day, we'd have to bring large items out for customers. We also had an outlet store, so we often had to bring out unboxed appliances. So one day, a customer comes in with a receipt for a fridge that he bought from the outlet store. So I grab it and bring it out. The guy has a pickup truck, with a very tall canopy over the back, and a bed that was absolutely full of construction debris. Now, the crap was level with the top of the pickup bed, but the canopy was pretty tall and would accommodate most of the fridge if it was laying on its back. Anyway, we shoved it in, but it didn't quite fit far enough to close the back doors. So I ran and grabbed some nylon twine to tie the two door handles together to keep it from flying out. At this point, the customer starts giving me crap for even bringing out the weak twine that'll apparently break immediately. I pointed out that the twine was absolutely as strong as it could be and definitely would not break. But he started rifling around in the back of his truck, and the guy pulls out a 10-foot long cord. It was a coaxial cable, like a TV cable cable, that plugs into your TV. The guy then says to me, Here, now this is strong. Now I couldn't help but look at him like he was insane. You might make the case that it is somewhat strong, but there's no way at all that you could tie it together to secure it. It would clearly unravel almost instantly. I tactfully try to explain this to him, but he just got madder and madder, saying that he knows better than I do and I'd better let him do what he wants. Okay, so I complied. I began to realize that I'd better get a witness to me explaining to this dude that he was on crack. So I called loss prevention, and they came down and we together explained to him that we can't guarantee that his rigged BS would properly secure his load, and if something happens, we would not be liable. Loss prevention then took some photos of the completely tied up job as proof that he was happy with the job. So fast forward 15 minutes, the guy's back in our parking lot. There's no fridge in his truck and he's steaming mad. He then screams that he wants to see the store manager, so I call the manager and then also call loss prevention, who came a little bit later. So apparently, the guy drives down the road, and about a quarter mile away, he turns right to get on the freeway ramp, at which time the back doors fly open, as the coaxial cable snapped and the fridge flew out. Apparently, it was currently sitting in three pieces on the side of the freeway entrance. The guy then screams at the store manager, complaining that I completely messed up loading his car, and he wants a new fridge. At this point, loss prevention shows up and explains to the manager that it wasn't quite the way he was saying it. Loss prevention then tells the manager that I offered to secure it tightly with our approved, super strong twine, but the customer insisted that he use a coaxial cable instead. He also made it clear that I felt that this would not secure the fridge, and in fact called him up to document the situation and then shows him the photos of what it looked like and what the customer said he approved. The manager then looks at the photo, he rolls his eyes and then tells the customer, I'm sorry sir, but this is completely on you. And then the manager walks away. I guess the situation was so clear cut to the manager that he wasn't gonna give an inch. The guy sputtered that he was gonna sue us, and in the distance, without turning around, the manager just says, it's always your prerogative to throw away even more of your money. The guy never sued. Guys, I don't even know what to say to this, like, a coaxial cable? Massive props to OP for calling loss prevention to help document this absurdity. Like, the guy should have listened to the employee who helps load items in a vehicle on a daily basis, right? But, hey, the customer's always, always right. Except when they're not. So my house is at the end of a close. Now, this is basically a small, longish, private dead-end road to which our house was the last one of. When you reached the end, the actual road morphed into our driveway. Now, our driveway was a different color and was separated by hedges. It was clearly our driveway. We owned the land. Upon purchasing the house, my parents were not warned of any a-hole neighbors. The driveway has space for four cars. We have one. It's rarely used, as both of my parents take the train to London for work and walk to the station. This is relevant. So one day, we come back from a two-week holiday and find an old car plonked in our driveway. Now at first, we say nothing, because we have no issue with someone using our driveway just to visit their family temporarily. 
But when the car kept leaving and coming back, we started to get annoyed. They hadn't even asked us. Now, we don't use the other three spaces on the driveway, mind you, but this is our property, and the rudeness pissed us off. So the next time the car pulls into our driveway, we're waiting. We open the door, confront the driver, and ask him to nicely stop using our driveway as a public car park. The neighbor gets annoyed. He says we don't use it, and that he always used to use it, as the old neighbors had no issue. He then looks my dad dead in the eye and says, You can park anywhere else, but leave me my space on this driveway, or I'll be pissed. My dad replies and goes, We can park anywhere else? In that case, we won't park where you park your car. Now at this, the old, rude man smiles. He thinks he's won. The guy then walks off to a few doors down to his house. Now, I think my dad's given up and let him win, and I'm a bit disappointed. The next day, I wake up for college to the sound of my dad's car. The old man's left, gone to work, and my dad's in the process of parking his bunged up massive Land Rover right over the entrance to our massive driveway, meaning that no other cars can enter. Technically, my dad parked anywhere else, other than where the old man wanted to leave his car. Okay guys, so reading the post, I was thinking, why the heck did you not just call police right then and there, and had the man towed off your property? And then I read the comments. Okay, so apparently in the UK where the story takes place, you're allowed to park on anybody's driveway. So I did a little bit of digging. And Steve-O, if I'm wrong, please don't put this in the video, okay? So apparently the law states that it's not illegal for someone else to leave their car on your drive, even if the homeowner hasn't given permission. So if someone parks on your driveway and you call the police over it, they're not going to be able to do anything about it. They're not even going to issue a caution. The Road Traffic Act means that the local authorities are in charge of parking enforcement. However, they've also got no power when it comes to strangers parking on your driveway. When a car is on the drive, it's technically on private property, and the council has no authority to remove it. They also added if this happens to you, the only course of action is to speak to the vehicle owner and try to resolve the situation sensibly. If you try to remove their car, then it is illegal and you could find yourself in trouble. If the owner won't budge, you can potentially take legal action, as it could be classed as trespassing. However, a civil case can be lengthy and very costly. Guys, so in other words, if you have an idiot who constantly parks on your driveway, you need to beat them up, because that's the only way. Like, that'll get annoying so, so fast. I work at a pub, and I'm manager for the night shift. Our policy is that managers should be trained in all roles of the pub, so they can help out everybody. Even the owner occasionally helps out and does jobs just for the heck of it. So when I started working, I was the jack of all trades of the pub. I started as a host and busser, and then later got trained in bartending and server work. If there was an employee who needed help, I was the go-to guy. One night, we were very packed and I was working host. One of the younger bussers needed help and was falling behind in his job. I asked the owner if he would help cover me at the host desk while I helped clear the floodgate of backed up dishes. The owner agreed. So when I return back towards the front desk, I see a woman screaming at the owner, asking for the manager. He then looks up at me and calls me over. He introduces me as the manager. The Karen then lets out the banshee inside of her, and she tells me that this man sucks at his job, and she wants me to fire him on the spot, and also to give her a free meal as well as gift cards. She demands we also get the owner so she can talk to him. I tell her that I'll go talk to the owner and make sure that our host is scolded, and she yells at us to bring him out right now. So the owner and I both go back to the office and we just start laughing, and then walk back out with the owner behind me. We walk up to her and tell her, here's the owner, do you have anything you'd like to discuss with him? And her face goes bright red. Turns out, she wanted to sit her and her two kids at the only available 10 person table, and we had a family of 12 coming for it. The look on her face was priceless when she realized that she had been screaming at the owner. The boss and I still laugh about it to this day, about how silly she acted. It was a great night. I still work at the pub to this day, and I'm content with the restaurant bustle. So I used to work for my grandparents at an oil farm in Texas. I was 17 years old, freshly graduated from high school, and had moved from the Midwest to Texas to live with my grandparents. The building I worked at was essentially a tin building on the job site where my grandma and I worked. I was the one that would make sure all the new hires' paperwork was in order, and they had all their OSHA classes finished. So this went on for two months with no issue, until one fateful day. A regular Florida man comes in as a new hire and came to my office to finish his new hire paperwork. Once he was in my office, I found that he had no safety training to speak of, and I informed him that his next day or two would be spent in my office watching safety videos. 
Now at this, the guy immediately flies into a rage, screaming that he wouldn't have some little girl teaching him how to do his job. Which again, I was a 17 year old female. So I go to my grandfather, who was my boss at the time, obviously very confused and uncomfortable and unsure of how I should proceed. To which my grandfather said, you wanna fire him? Now cue my excitement. My grandfather follows me to my office and I, as a 17 year old, get to fire this grown man sitting in front of me. I start directing him to gather his things and leave and he starts a huge fit, yelling and cursing at me before he noticed my grandfather standing in the door with his gun holstered on his hip. He then very quietly gets up and left. It was the most satisfying moment of my life. Guys, I would have loved to have seen the guy's face right then and there. Like, dude, relax. She wasn't teaching you how to do your job. At most job sites, a lot of the times, no safety training equals no work. Like, I don't know what the heck that guy was expecting. And maybe it was best to not have him on the job site if he blows his lid with something as stupid as that. A year out of school in the early 1990s, I procured a job as a business analyst for a large family-owned tech company. The business was located in the booming heart of technology at the time, and it was very profitable. As tech took off over the next decade, the company thrived and remained family-owned. The rich family and company became exceedingly wealthy, with a valuation and net worth in the low nine figures. Now, the family that owned it was quite neurotic. They were very moody and had a reputation as very ruthless and greedy when it came to financing, deal-making, employees, etc. I truly believe this is what held them back from ultimately becoming a household name as a company. As I progressed in the company, I gained more and more face time with the owners. I worked on some projects directly with ownership that really paid off and gained me even greater access to their inner circle. Now, like a lot of people at the time and particularly those who worked in tech, I was heavily invested in tech stocks. I discussed some of my investments and gains with the ownership as casual conversation, though investing had nothing to do with my role in the company. That is until one day in late 1999. The owner comes to me and asks if I would invest some of his personal money. He wanted me to take some big risks, to see if they would pay off using $1 million of his personal money. Now I was a bit hesitant, but being in my late 20s and wanting to prove myself, I said I would. I asked for a written agreement where they acknowledged that this wasn't my role in the company and it was a matter between the owner and myself. And to document my compensation for this side arrangement, which is 20% of all profits. So around the same time and by working in the industry, I started to notice the weaknesses associated with a lot of tech companies. They just weren't living up to their hype and stock prices and some seemed like they were starting to run out of money. I had no inside information, just a strong sense of which companies were struggling based on my work in the business. Based on this sense, I started using both my money and the owner's money to short tech companies just after the new year in 2000. Now, for anyone unfamiliar with shorting, it means if the value of a stock decreases, the value of the investment increases. I've had a few long positions, but my overall position was very short. So since the owner wanted big risk and big reward, I used his money and obtained leverage, or margin, from the financial institution where I maintained both his and my trading accounts. The accounts were separate, but both under my name. Again, I documented this and gained consent. Well, both my account and his suffered some moderate losses in the first two months of 2000, before the bubble began to burst, and both accounts, but his in particular, began to skyrocket. In June, the company began to suffer a downturn. We were still profitable, but since we provided tech services and products, we were not immune to weaknesses in the broader market. I had not informed the owner of my short strategy. So the owner comes to me one day and asked how his money was doing, saying that he suspected it was way down like the general market was. To his surprise, I informed him that while we still had some money tied up in options and shorts, based on the positions I closed, there was $1.35 million in cash, sitting in the account that belonged to him. Again, I still had a bunch of open positions, which, if memory serves, were worth about a million dollars on that date. But the positions I closed had yielded $1.35 million in cash, just sitting in his account, which was in my name. The owner, either through ignorance or lack of attention, said, Great, $1.35 million. Fantastic work in this down market. Now, would you please wire it to me? Now, I responded that I would, but I would be taking my 20% of the $350,000 profit, or $70,000, before wiring him the $280,000 and he did not like that. I also reminded him that I had open positions that had yet to pay off or close, but I didn't state the amount. 
He once again appeared to not understand or comprehend the open position statement, but instead totally focused on and became enraged about my rightful claim for $70,000. He goes on and on about how times were tough and how I should be grateful for a job, particularly at my young age, and that the entire $350,000 was necessary for him and the company. Now I knew this wasn't true, based on my position within the company. After two separate conversations, the owner didn't seem to grasp that the open positions would yield at least some more income, and thus additional profit, and just demanded his money back. So I complied and decided not to mention it again. I sent him back the entire $1.35 million and continued to manage the open positions to the best of my ability. And here's the kicker, the owner never brought it up again. He seemed to think that the $1.35 million payment was the entire value of the account, and never understood or remembered that the open position still existed. Given the fact that he was dishonest with me, I didn't feel the need to disabuse him of that notion. So ultimately, after a bit more gain, I covered all the shorts, and exercised all of the options for an additional $1.8 million. I worked for the company for about 3 more years and the owner never asked me about it. I know it's a bit crass and even shady, but given his dishonesty with me over $70,000, I felt justified in keeping the additional $1.8 million. I paid the taxes on the gain, and went on my way with a fantastic nest egg. Nobody has asked me about it, and I've only told the story to a few people, and even then only after the statute of limitations passed. Now, the final ironic cherry on top of the sundae is that during my remaining 3 years, I gained greater influence with the ownership because they considered me loyal for giving back the $1.35 million, and not making too much of a stink over the $70,000 profit. But little did they know, I got the better of them. The company eventually folded due to family disputes, but my understanding is that the ownership walked away in very good financial position. They likely could have been a much better and greater company if they hadn't practiced the same dishonesty that they showed me, with their vendors, clients, and employees. Thanks for reading, and hopefully you enjoyed. So this post has stirred up a lot of controversy. There's people saying that OP is a fallout thief, or others are saying how satisfying it is that he essentially got the better of a scummy boss who didn't pay out the commission that he promised. Now I personally did find it kinda weird that OP's boss just happened to wire him a million dollars to trade stocks, since he got a few wins here and there. Like the better option would have just been for OP to say, hey, I don't want to manage your money, but I'll tell you what I'm doing. And I know OP said he paid taxes on his portion of the $1.8 million gain, but what about the $1.35 million that he just happened to wire back to his boss? For sure he'd be on the hook for capital gains on that, since it's under his name. But with that said, a super satisfying story nonetheless. I'm a nurse. I work in nursing homes and do the paperwork that's sent to Medicare. The paperwork has to be submitted in a timely manner, or the facility goes from $700 a day to $200 a day. Just tossing numbers out, don't remember the amount. This is important in a second. So, I worked for a facility that I loved. The people were wonderful, and it was a huge family. The staff ate their meals with patients, the independent people visited often, and our bosses were easy to approach. And then the bosses retired, at the same time. Our board decided that maybe they would make more money if we hired a management company, and all the changes happened within weeks of each other. They hired a traveling nurse to head up the skilled nursing unit for a year. We didn't react well to her. She never smiled, she would never look at you if you asked a question, and she decided that new rules were needed. So shortly after she was hired, she began firing everybody. It was like a war zone had erupted on the floor. Nobody smiled, there was no laughter, no visitors, no family meals, and loads of stress. I was the last one fired. I had zero write-ups before she came, and now, I'd been written up for things like cell phone in my pocket, drink on my desk, and filling a certification form late, so they had their three write-ups. On Friday, the administrator calls me into his office, and I'm informed that I've been terminated. I'm floored, I worked my ass off, and I'm actually great at my job, I've been there for 7 years. I'm then escorted to the office to gather my stuff. They've turned off my computer, they then ask for my passwords and escort me from the building. And this is where the malicious compliance comes in. So they called me in to fire me just as I was creating a packet to send to Medicare. I was never able to send it. They never asked if things were situated since it was Friday. And I volunteered them no information. Remember that timely matter? Well, that Friday was the very last day to submit about 30 forms. Most were 14-day assessments that literally covered 14 days. 
So a friend who does billing called me and she let me know that the default cost them over $100,000 by the time they figured everything out. <laughs> so that totally makes sense, right? Hire a management company to make more money. Management company fires all the good staff and costs over $100,000. Seriously, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, guys. And that, my friends, brings us to another end of our slash malicious compliance. Guys, if you enjoyed the stories today, do hit that thumbs up. And if you missed the last episode on the channel, I'll link it right here. A Karen gets upset that OP doesn't have Christmas lights on her house. Check it out if you haven't, and myself and Steva will see you guys in the next one. We love you.